Madam President, we're talking about the National Defense Authorization Act. We're talking about preventing and dealing with threats to our country. I want to describe a hypothetical threat, a threat that throws millions of people out of work almost overnight, causes a stock market collapse, cripples the airline industry, has people afraid to leave their homes, the state scrambling for materials to prepare and cope with the attack. The attack comes in waves, just as it seems to be receding, it comes back. It's difficult to know the sources of the attack. The country is divided. There are conspiracy theories and polarization and politicization of this awful situation. Madam President, I'm not describing the pandemic. That's what we've experienced. I'm describing a potential catastrophic cyber attack on this country. Everything that I listed would be part of what would happen in the case of such an attack, plus our networks would likely be down. No more working from home, no Zoom, no meetings. The economy, the effect on the economy would be twice at least the effect of the coronavirus. The electric grid could likely be compromised. The electric grid, people think about the lights, but in the South, electricity is necessary for air conditioning. In the North, electricity is, is necessary for firing oil and gas-fired furnaces. We're talking about no air conditioning and no heat. It could be in the dead of winter. We're talking about airports closed. We're talking about the financial system potentially in tatters. People's lives and livelihoods, their life savings could disappear at the stroke of a key. We're talking about thousands of water systems across the country that could be compromised by a cyber attack, making people afraid to drink the very tap water in their homes. We would have uncertainty, economic catastrophe, and an enormous challenge to this country. And by the way, Madam President, what I just talked about is not entirely hypothetical. It's happening now. Our financial system is under attack. I talked to a utility executive recently whose system is being cyber attacked three million times a day. Today, I've talked to small banks in Maine who are being attacked thousands of times a day. We've had ransomware attacks on our towns and cities across the country. They've hacked our OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, and gotten the personal data of millions of American citizens. And of course, we know about the attacks on our election infrastructure and the danger of those attacks continuing and escalating. The financial system is at risk. The energy grid is at risk. The transportation sector is at risk. Mr. President, this is a very serious and immediate challenge. The important, one of the important lessons from the pandemic, I think one of the overall lessons from the pandemic is the unthinkable can happen. If you had told any of us a year ago we wouldn't be leaving our homes, we'd be wearing masks when we went out. Our restaurants and and social gatherings would be closed. Nobody would believe that. Well, it's happened. And a catastrophic cyber attack can happen. And that's why in the National Defense Act last year, the Congress passed and the President signed the creation of something called the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. A 16-member commission, four members of Congress, totally bipartisan, four members from the executive and six members from the private sector to take an in-depth look at this threat and to try to come up with a national strategy and set of plans to cope with it now before it happens. That was the mission of our commission. We met over 30 times. We had hundreds of hours of consideration. We had hundreds of witnesses and uh, submissions from uh, information from around the country, thousands of pages of documents, came up with a report. Ironically, our report was released on March 11th, it was probably the last significant large meeting in these buildings before the shutdown occasioned by the pandemic. We had dozens of recommendations. 
I'm proud to say that 11 of our most important recommendations are in the defense bill that's going to be considered this week. They've been included in the bill that has been reported out by the committee on a totally bipartisan basis. And that's an important first step in implementing this project. The main point I want to make, though, is how urgent this is. Just as the pandemic was unthinkable, nobody can conceive of an attack that would bring down the electric system or the financial system or the transportation system or the internet, but it can happen. The technology is there. And we all think in terms of World War II and conventional forces. I believe, Mr. President, the next Pearl Harbor will be cyber. That's going to be the attack that attempts to bring this country to its knees. And as we've learned in the pandemic, we have vulnerability and we have to prepare for it. So we've got amendments in the defense bill that relate to the Department of Defense, and that's good. But one of the issues with this subject matter is it's spread across the government, both in the executive sector and here. And we've got 18 or 20 amendments that are pending that we hope we're going to be able to uh, improve and get into this bill with the clearance of other committees. But getting 20 amendments cleared because of the multiplicity of jurisdictions that covers cyber, we had to get 180 clearances from committees across the Congress on both, in both houses. And that indicates how fractured this policy process is. And the same thing is true in the executive branch. The authority for cyber is in Homeland Security, it's in the CIA, it's in the FBI, it's in the NSA. It is scattered throughout the government. And it is something that we propose that we try to make sense of this process and provide both in the executive branch and in the Congress central points that can have authority and responsibility over this area. There's a great deal of work left to be done. We had some 80 recommendations. We hope that as many as 15 or more will be in the defense bill, but there are others that will require other committees, and we look forward to working with them. Two of our recommendations in terms of making sense of the organization relate to this. One relates to this body, one relates to the executive. This body, we're recommending that we create a select committee on cyber here in the Senate and one in the House. Exactly as was done in the 70s when it was realized that intelligence was too important to be scattered throughout the jurisdiction of all the committees, that's when the Select Committee on Intelligence was created. We're recommending the same change here. In the executive, we're recommending a Senate-approved National Cyber Director in the Executive Office of the President, analogous to the Trade Representative, who's a Senate-approved provision appointed by the president, serves at the pleasure of the president. The idea is to give the president a central point of contact to deal with the multiplicity of authorities that are involved in this issue throughout the executive branch of the federal government. One of my principal principles of business when I was doing contracts and working in business was I want one throat to choke. I want one place where I can go to hold someone accountable and to hold them accountable not only for re reacting but for planning. And that's what we're proposing to be brought forward and we hope that we're going to be able to earn the support of the administration. The commission, as I mentioned, had four members of Congress, four members from the executive branch who made significant contributions and six members from the private sector. We had unanimous recommendations after an enormous amount of work and serious thought by very serious people from across this country. There's plenty of work left to be done. I want to thank the committee chairs and the leads and the staff and all of those who have worked with us to get these recommendations this far. But I also want to leave the Senate and the Congress and the American people with the knowledge that we're not there yet that we're vulnerable, that this is something that we have to attend to. This is not something that may happen. This is something that's happening now, and it may happen, it will likely happen in a more seri to a more serious degree in the future. The pandemic has taught us 
some important lessons about planning and preparing and providing. And that's what we're talking about here. We have to plan for the unthinkable. We have to prepare continuity of the economy, continuity of government. We have to prepare in terms of what our deterrent policy is, because the best cyber attack is the one that doesn't occur. And we also have to provide the structures and the resources to be sure that we're ready to defeat, to meet and defeat this next challenge. Mr. President, I consider this one of the most serious threats facing this country, and it's easy in the midst of the pandemic and all the other issues that are swirling around in election year and everything else. But it is so clear that this is an overwhelming risk to the future of this country that we have to take it seriously, we have to respond, we have to be ready, we have to deter, and we have to prepare. Mr. President, I deeply hope that we will continue the momentum that's begun in this bill and be able to take the next step and the other recommendations and other good ones that may come forward in this process so that we will be prepared, we, build, we will be able to respond and prevail. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Yeah, Mr. President.